Hi, my name is Erfan Vafai, and I'm an Extension Program Specialist at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, dealing mainly in integrated pest management. I'm going to be talking today on a relatively new scale pest of crepe myrtles, often known as the crepe myrtle bark scale, which is found here in the southern USA. First, starting off about the crepe myrtles, uh, they are a commonly uh, cultivated tree for landscapes and in nursery crops here, especially down in the south with different uh, types of colors and, and blooms and then different blooming periods throughout the summer as well. Here's an example of a nice beautiful bloom uh, that can also be very attractive to pollinators as well during the summertime. Right now, uh, crepe myrtles have been cultivated in the U.S. for over 175 years to get all these different types of varieties. And it's a very common landscape plant and is valued at about $46 million in nursery crop sales back in 2009. And the nice thing about it and why it's often used so much in the landscape down here is that there's so very little maintenance required. There's very few key pests. There's the maybe the crepe myrtle aphid, which can sometimes be a, a little bit of a, a nuisance. But other than that, uh, for the most part, they are very low maintenance. As you can see here, they are often um, planted in the medians of, of these highways and again, very low maintenance typically needed, but now with this new pest, uh, they're requiring to uh, do some, some level of management. And in terms of where crepe myrtles can actually grow, uh, they kind of go from around zone 6 in the USDA plant hardiness zone map uh, and all the way down to uh, some of the higher zones. As you can see here, anything that's kind of green and further south from there is where crepe myrtles can, uh, can really grow and are potentially already in the landscape and a, as a popular crop. Now, the crepe myrtle bark scale was first seen in North America in 2004, just north of Texas, and it's now found pretty much all across uh, the USA. Uh, from all the way down in a recent finding in Seattle and Washington, all the way down to uh, all the way to the East Coast in Virginia, and all the way down south over here in Texas. And it's originally from uh, Asia, and there was very little uh, writings on it originally. There was maybe a couple publications that were in Chinese. Other than that, we don't know a whole lot about this scale pest. And here's what the adults look like. So you can actually see uh, the adults uh, similar to any other type of uh, soft or like a felt type scale. Um, here's our high infestation is later in the season will really uh, populate the branches and you get the city mold formation on top of the branches. And here's what they look like on the microscope. You can see again those large fluffs are the adults that are pupating. And here are the small nymphs or what we call crawlers. This is the stage at which they're crawling around and looking for a good spot to settle, and then they'll feed until eventually uh, they, um, they, they pupate and become, they, they stop moving around. Here is the, their relative size, the, the tip of a pin. As you can see, those crawlers are very small, so you really need a dissecting microscope to be able to see them, uh, see their numbers which can make it challenging for monitoring their early populations. And this here with their egg sacs, so if you actually take one of those uh, round fluffs and you open it up, you'll get a bunch of eggs inside there. And you'll find a female in there as well that's basically laid her eggs and she's going to die in there and the crawlers are going to come out of that egg sac. We can see here on the far left, uh, it's not uncommon that if a tree has been infested, uh, has a history of infestation, then uh, later within a summer season, it can get uh, incredibly covered with uh, the crepe myrtle bark scale and causing a lot of city mold as well. In the middle graphic there, you can see that uh, the, the female egg sac is kind of the slightly more round sac, whereas the males are more ovular. We'll get a closer look here. You can see the males also have these two little uh, features coming out, which will actually be a part of the winged male as it emerges. So the males are actually, the adult males are, are winged and will come out and be able to disperse that way. The current distribution map we have on eddmaps.org forward slash CMBS where everyone can, uh, anyone can report a potential sighting of crepe myrtle bark scale and uh, there are some of us, us entomologists who can approve that. And uh, as you can see right now they're pretty widely spread. Here it is all the way out in Virginia. 
and uh, we have them kind of in, in pretty much uh, you know all over the south and so any of these spaces that are not yet colored it's possible that it just has not been reported but there's a good chance it's already there so the objectives of our, our study uh, that we did uh, starting back in 2015 we want to determine the seasonal population changes in Crete myrtle bark scales so by understanding uh, kind of their generations or cycles throughout a season, we can uh, have some better recommendations on how to actually potentially manage them. Then we want to determine the population phenology, so we actually want to see whether those population cycles are in some way related to uh, degree days, to see if we can use degree days as a good prediction model for uh, when those crawlers start emerging. Our next objective was to determine whether there is a spatial difference in population cycles of crepe myrtle bark scale within a tree. So we, uh, if we want to set up some good, reliable monitoring tools, we need to know whether monitoring at the base of the tree versus the higher branches uh, is going to show us a big difference in terms of the, the types of crawl, the numbers of crawlers and their population cycles. And lastly, we want to determine whether crepe myrtle bark scale has any natural enemies here actually in the USA, so looking for natural predators. So for the first objective, what we did was we wrapped double-sided sticky tape around five branches on each tree, and every week we would replace that double-sided sticky tape. So essentially that, that tape that goes around that branch, any crawler that crawls over gets stuck within that week's time. So when you remove that tape and you count all the crawlers on there, you get an idea of the activity of the crawlers on that tree. We also monitored uh, trees that three trees that had a history of crit myrtle bark scale within a certain area. So we're, we're having essentially three replicates within a given area. And then we would count uh, the crit myrtle bark scales on a tape and measure the tape length to calculate the number of crit myrtle bark scale crawlers per square centimeter. We monitored, uh, we had areas in Tyler, Texas, Dallas, Texas, College Station, Huntsville, Texas, and Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, the crit myrtle bark scale crawlers were averaged across the five tapes on each tree. So we would uh, kind of summate all of those, those tapes within a tree because uh, sometimes a, a tape would go missing. Sometimes the tapes would fall off. And not a very common occurrence, but it would happen. And if we were to actually sum those tapes instead of getting the average, uh, then that would, that would introduce a lot of variation in our data. So we averaged uh, the number of crit myrtle bark scale uh, on those tapes within a tree. Objective two, uh, we used uh, degree days to calculate, uh, we used degree days from uh, weather stations uh, from each location, so from Tyler, Dallas, College Station, and Little, Lo Little Rock. And the degree data was, um, was acquired using degreedays.net uh, with a four degrees Celsius as the lower temperature threshold and using January 1st as the biofix date. And the degree day data was validated by comparing cumulative degree days with a nearby weather station. So there's been cases sometimes where uh, something funny goes on with a weather station, uh, and, and so it gets some wonky data. So we want to make sure that we're validating our data to make sure it's reliable. All right, so first we're starting off with objective one, looking at those population cycles. And as you can see here, uh, so we have the six different graphs that represent our six different locations. Uh, on the bottom axis is uh, the date the trap was actually collected. And on the y-axis, we have the mean crepe myrtle bark scale per square centimeter. So as you can see, we, we tend to have, all of them have an initial peak that starts around ooh, May, June, July area. Especially in May, June, we have, uh, we have in Tyler, Texas, Huntsville, College Station, and uh, the, the two Huntsville locations. Uh, both of them, they all kind of around May time, you start to get a big peak in the, in the populations. In Dallas, the monitoring didn't start until June, and so we don't really know whether there was a peak earlier. And in Little Rock, there's something uh, kind of interesting going on here, where between February and March, we start off with really high numbers. And we're thinking uh, this is because we were still hashing out some of the monitoring protocol, and uh, the researchers, they were actually placing tapes on top of some of the egg sacs. And so what happened was it would create potentially a little microclimate under that tape, which would create a warmer environment. And so those eggs would hatch and those crawlers would come out much earlier than they would uh, if they were exposed to ambient temperature. Now, if we put all those graphs together into one graph, uh, although it gets a little bit uh, kind of convoluted here, it gives us a better idea of how these graphs kind of overlap. Now we can get a lot better idea. You can see those initial peaks are all kind of within that 
ooh, May, June area. And just those crawler, that crawl activity just starts just before May. So we can see here, additionally, there's a second peak that happens just between July and August, which may be a second generation of the crepe myrtle bark scale. We have many other little peaks in between as well, which may also be uh, separate smaller generations, but we're not entirely sure at this point. Additionally, if we look very specifically at when those, uh, that crawler activity really starts working towards a peak for the different areas we monitored, College Station happens right in about mid-May, whereas we have uh, Huntsville 1 and Huntsville 2, both in a similar area, occur near the end of May. And lastly, we have Tyler, Texas, that occurs right at the beginning of May. Now, where things get a little bit interesting is objective two. If we look at the cumulative degree days, now instead of just looking at the date on the, uh, the x-axis, that's all that's changed here, we can see that now we have called station occurring almost at 1,000 degree days, and we have all the other three, Tyler and the two Huntsvilles, occurring at about ooh, 1,150 degree days. So they all, they're all within about 150 degree days of when that crawler activity just begins uh, to really increase towards that initial peak. So this shows some promise. Now, mind you, this is only one year's worth of data, and so we need to look at multiple years. But this shows some promise that degree days uh, might, might serve as a good predicting tool for when that crawler activity really starts. So if we actually do a quick little comparison here, if we're looking at date uh, versus degree days, you can see how those pyramids really, or those little peaks, uh, line up quite a bit nicer when we're looking at cumulative degree days. For objective three, we're looking to determine whether there's a spatial difference in population cycles of crepe myrtle bark scale within a tree. And that's where we had a total of six double-sided sticky tapes placed on each tree in College Station. There's a total of 12 trees, three on lower branches and three on higher branches. And we then would, again, uh, count the number of crepe myrtle bark scale, measure tape length to calculate the crepe myrtle bark scale per square centimeters. And this was, again, uh, this, these tapes were replaced on a weekly basis to monitor them throughout a season. So here's an example of a tree. And as you can see, the lower ones were probably right about at waist height, whereas the upper ones are really above the head. And right after, you already have some branching going on of the crepe myrtles. So the idea was that you might actually see a difference in crawler activity between lower and upper. And we want to make sure that we are using an accurate way of, of really assessing the, the crawler activity and really catching the early crawler activity um, within, within a particular tree. So we can see here all the 12 trees uh, in a single pane. And um, the, the x-axis, so the bottom axis, is going to show the date that it was collected. And the y-axis is looking at the mean number of crepe myrtle bark scales per square centimeter. What's most important here is to notice if there's any great differences in the patterns of the, of the numbers or the, the cycles or the, the peaks, I should say, of crepe myrtle bark scale throughout, uh, you know, throughout the, the summer that they were measured. As you can see here, uh, for example, in tree one in the very top left, we have those lower branches and the upper branches, they really start, they're fluctuating, especially near the beginning in a very similar fashion. Now, even though the numbers vary greatly, you can see the, the lower branches initially have much higher numbers, they both start working towards a peak. And so uh, this just demonstrates that they're, they're uh, you know, it's not as if the crawlers are moving from the lower branches and then aren't found in the lower branches later on and only found in the upper branches. They are found kind of equally uh, or similarly across the upper and the lower branches. We can see this trend happening for all of the trees. An objective four was to determine whether crepe myrtle bark, bark scale has any natural enemies in the USA. So this was simply done just by observation, by um, essentially observing and collecting any natural enemies we found while we were doing our tape collections. So some of the predators that we found included lady beetle larvae. So here, such as, uh, it looks similar to the mealybug destroyer there on the left. We have another uh, lady beetle larva on the right. Uh, looking at them more specifically here, we can see um, we have a number of different species and especially later in the season, we start getting a lot of a lot of pupa out in the field, and so this is a, it suggests that uh, there might be potential for augmentation earlier in the season to manage the crepe myrtle bark scale later in the season. But right now, 
it appears as though you know the scale has been established here since 2004 and even the areas in which it was established since then there still are crater metal bark scale so the natural enemies aren't quite um, sufficient to stop the scale pest but they may be helping suppress and by an early release there there may be potential to actually really um, knock back their numbers significantly and that is all i'd just like to acknowledge everyone who helped out with this project uh, patrick ridzak and john nematty who are my research assistants who spent many grueling hours under the microscope counting the scales uh, also john garcia who was a research assistant again counting the scales out in Dallas and Evan Anderson at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville who uh, collected on a consistent basis for us those tapes uh, every seven days uh, so we can have that data set as well. I'd like to also thank uh, USDA NIFA and uh, the Horticultural Research Institute for helping uh, fund our project. Thank you.